So sorry for the delay. We are waiting for the rain to pass. Hello and happy Earth Day. My name is Erica Bugwalter and I am the Family and Interpretive Programs Manager here at the zoo. Today I've got one of our animal ambassadors. Her name is Shatner and she is a ball python. She and I are hanging out today to kick off a virtual series of events focusing on that Earth Day. Now today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and the zoo wants to celebrate with you. Now even though the zoo is closed due to COVID-19, the zoo is still committed to connecting you with our animals and our expert caretakers each and every day, especially on a day like Earth Day. Now we're gonna kick off that series of virtual events with five different videos focusing on conservation. Videos might focus on reptiles from Guatemala, gorillas in Africa, native birds in Oklahoma, and a couple more. Now, these videos will be every 30 minutes from now until 2 p.m. Now, we do want you guys to stick around during these videos because we've got a free gift for you. The first 20 people to comment why they love the Earth will be given a free Party for the Planet pollinator kit. The zoo will mail it straight to your home and you can have your own little conservation garden there. Now, if you would like to donate to the Oklahoma City Zoo to help offset some of our operational costs, the zoo has a uh, fundraising goal of $1,500. Or if you really like our Love Your Zoo shirts, like mine here, you can click the link in the caption to get your very own limited edition shirt. Now, we do hope you stick around. Our next video is coming to you at noon, and I hope that we'll see you there. <laughs> Welcome back to our celebration of the 50th Earth Day here at the Oklahoma City Zoo. My name is Erica Buckwalter, and I am the Family and Interpretive Program Manager of here. We're hanging out in our Dan Moran Aviary with our curator of birds, Eddie Hitting. So Eddie, can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at the zoo? Yeah, I'm the uh, career bird, so what I do is I manage our bird collection, the same time. Um, I choose what birds we want to work with. I work with our different SSDs to acquire birds, help to find exhibits, help set things up for breeding, all of that. So really, all things birds? All things birds. We like the birds. Awesome. Now I know we have a lot of exotic birds here at the Oklahoma City Zoo. But we also have some native Oklahoma birds. One is playing in this exhibit. But Eddie, can you tell us a little bit more about our Oklahoma native birds here? Yeah, I mean, if you come to our zoo and go to our Oklahoma trails exhibit, our area here, we have species like roadrunner, we have bob white quail, we have morning dust. A lot of the stuff you're going to see if you're driving through Oklahoma or even in your backyard. Wow, that's, that's really awesome. I love hearing about birds we can find in our own backyard. Now, is it really important to protect those kind of animals? Oh, absolutely. I mean, birds are like one of our biggest indicators of how our environment is doing. Um, if you think about it, Earth Day started in 1970. Since 1970, we've lost one in four birds in, our, in the United States. That's almost three billion birds that we've lost. I mean, think about that, three billion birds. That's three billion birds that we don't have to into our feeders, that we don't have any insects out of our garden. Um, it, Shows us, it's going to show us what our health of our environment is going to be, and that in fact is going to show what the health is going to be for us. Well, I, I can't believe that loss of life just since 1970. Over 3 billion birds. That's crazy. Now, I know that our zoo is working really hard with our conservation partners, like the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and the Sutton Aviary Research Center. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, I mean, the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, they manage over like 90 different sites throughout our state. 
uh, what they do is they will do surveys. They manage to, to look at what our bird populations are doing so they can actually make decisions on land management of what they're going to do. Um, the Southern Avian Fair, um, 20 years ago, did one of the biggest surveys ever of Oklahoma birds. And they're actually getting ready to do that again right now. And they, they go through our, the whole state of Oklahoma, different locations, over 600 locations, looking at the populations of birds that we have. That's awesome. Those are really, really fantastic partnerships that we have. Now, how do we support them? Because we have a good partnership with them, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, OPWC, or Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, is one of our legacy partners. Um, we help them financially, and with that financial support, they have to go out and do things like the winter bird survey, the prairie chicken survey, the bat survey. And what's really cool, Erica, is our staff actually gets to go out into the field and help participate with all those surveys, which means that they're out there hands-on helping our environment. The office, the uh, second avian fair uh, with the green bird survey, um, we were actually helping fund that survey through our Roundup for Conservation uh, funds, which is money that our guests have given. Every time they come out here and make a purchase and round up their purchase, that money goes into that fund. And that's a huge undertaking. It's going to be something that's very valuable for our group. Wow, that is just so cool. I love how Oklahomans are helping us support birds in the wild. I think that is fantastic. Now, Eddie, thank you so much for sharing that information with us. And I'm glad you pointed out that our staff gets to go out on these bird surveys. I've gone on prairie chicken survey, and I saw one in the wild. It was the coolest because nobody had seen, actually seen one in years. They only heard them. So I was so excited to see that wild species and to know that we are really impacting animals in the wild every single day, and so are you. So you can continue to help those animals in the wild by planting native uh, pollinating trees and flowers and bushes and things like that to keep pollinators around because we know that they're important for the environment. Those native trees that you plant give the seeds and the berries that our native birds need because even though so many of them have disappeared over the last 50 years, we want to make sure that we're bringing them back to our environment. Another thing that you can do is you can put little decals on your windows at your house to make sure that you minimize bird strikes, which is where birds just bop right there into the window. It's obviously not a great thing for them. And lastly, if you all can keep your cats in your house, we would really appreciate that too because they are predators of our native bird species. Now, we hope that you're enjoying our virtual party for the planet event. We've got a lot more videos coming around for you guys. Now, if you guys would like to donate to the zoo to help us offset that operational cost, you can go back to our Facebook page and pinned right there at the top is a donate button. Or if you guys love my Love Your Zoo shirt, you guys can click on the link to get your very own limited edition t-shirt. We really appreciate you guys spending time with us. And don't forget, the first 20 people to tell us why they love the Earth are going to get a free Party for the Planet pollinator kit. And we'll send that to you guys right in the mail. Now make sure you stick around and we'll see you in just a little while. Thanks everybody, have a good day. Us too. Welcome back to our, our celebration of virtual 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Now today we're going to be talking a little bit about gorilla conservation and hanging out with me I've got Candace Reynolds who is the director of PR and marketing. Hi everyone, happy Earth Day. All right Candace, can you um, tell me a little bit about our conservation partner Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund? Erica, I would love to. So the Oklahoma City Zoo has had a very long, ongoing relationship with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International, or Fossey Fund. The Fossey Fund was founded about 50, um, over 50 years ago by Diane Fossey, 
and they run the longest and largest guerrilla conservation organization in the world. Their motto is helping people to save gorillas. And their work can be divided and or organized into four pillars. Those four pillars are gorilla protection, scientific research, educating conservationists, and helping local communities. So the Diane Fossey Fund is doing all of that every day to help wild gorillas in Africa. Not only that, they're helping to save habitat that the gorillas live in and other animals as well. That's excellent. I love hearing about the way that they're saving gorillas. Now, you mentioned those four pillars. Would you want to tell me a little bit more about them? I would love to. So those four pillars are extremely important. And again, they really focus on everything that the Fossey Fund team is doing in Africa. So the first one I mentioned, gorilla protection. That is so key because every day the Fossey Fund teams provide boots on the ground protection for our gorillas. They send trackers out every day to protect um, over 50% of the mountain gorillas in Rwanda. And because of that protection, the populations there are actually increasing. They have doubled in size in, over the last 30 years. Mountain gorillas are the only species of great apes that are continuing or that are doing um, really well in the wild and their populations are growing. As a matter of fact, they were recently delisted um, from critically endangered to endangered, which is a great win for this amazing species. That second pillar I mentioned, scientific research. So this is really important because as I said, Diane Fossey team, they are running the largest database on gorillas in the world. The data that they collect from the Karasoki Research Center has contributed to over 300 publications on gorillas and the surrounding habitat. Um, and this information has been extremely important in learning more about these animals and other animals that they share their habitat with. The next one that we mentioned was education. Education, that's right. That's always Erica's favorite focus and such an important one. So the Fossey Fund team is dedicated to finding the the next generation of conservationists, those next people that are gonna follow in Diane Fossey's footsteps. So, how they're doing that? Well, some really key um, elements. First, they are teaching um, young African scientists the skills that they need to be leaders in conservation, education, and scientific research. They're also training local college students um, in roles that can help at the Fossey Fund. Um, help the Fossey Fund Foundation and also help in the national parks uh, protecting the gorillas. Um, something I didn't mention earlier, but a lot of the trackers also help with scientific research. So again, that training component really comes into play in um, educating those future conservationists. Fossey Fund is also um, dedicated to providing scholarships uh, to their team members and advanced degrees. Wow, that's excellent. I know. And then that last pillar I mentioned I think is probably the most important. So I said the Fossey Fund's motto is helping people saving gorillas, and they truly believe in that. They believe when people are thriving, the gorillas are thriving. So there and with the local communities, they do a lot of, a lot of important work to support the communities. This includes providing conservation um, education programs to all the local schools. They help provide um, access to clean water and healthcare, in addition to helping um, provide su uh, food security for all the local community members. So, amazing work. This is an amazing organization, and they've been going to, and doing this for a long time, so it's pretty incredible. Wow, I can't believe this has been going on for 50 years. Oh, that is really a miraculous organization. And what a great connection with 50th anniversary oh, birthday! 50 and 50, it's perfect. Now, Candace, you said a lot about the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, but how does that tie into our zoo here? I mean, we've got gorilla species, but what do we do to help support Diane Fossey? Yeah, no, great question, Erica. So, as I said, the Oklahoma City Zoo has had a long-standing partnership with Diana Fossey Gorilla Fund. They are one of our legacy conservation partners. And fund, we provide significant funding every year through the Oklahoma Zoological Society to support the work they're doing. As a matter of fact, the funds that we send support the day-to-day -day operations at the Karasoki Research Center. So we are really helping train those trackers, helping with that scientific data research, and keeping those mountain gorillas safe and their populations continuing to thrive. Um, not only that, so this is pretty cool. So in addition to the financial support that the Oklahoma City Zoo provides, <laughs> oh, we've got some action back here. <laughs> in addition to the financial support we provide, we've also sent staff to help the Fossey Fund team. As a matter of fact, I had the incredible opportunity of going myself 
and um, working with the team in Rwanda, and I provided communication training for their team, as well as helped produce a series of short videos about the four pillars that we talked about. So we hope these videos will help the Fosse Fund team further um, promote their mission, educate people about what they're doing, and in the long run, further support and save girls in the wild. Wow, I am just, that was amazing. I know. Thank you so much for this. Thanks to everybody that helps support the Oklahoma City Zoo. And that's really something we're going to be talking about today, right? Yes, we are. Yes. Now, thinking about that, like, I wonder what people can do at home. I know the zoo has this really neat program, something about recycling cell phones, but I'm not the expert on it. So the next person that I want to bring in is Stephanie, and she is our senior caretaker of primates. Can you tell me a little bit more about that cell phone? Absolutely, yeah. So here at the zoo, we have a cell phone recycling program. And the way that works is guests can come and donate their cell phones and small electronics. We send them to a great company called EcoCell, and they then um, recycle them or ensure that they're um, reused and put back into circulation. They also send us a portion of their profits and then redirect that to guerrilla organizations like the Dying Fossil Fund. Awesome, excellent. And um, is there a certain time period that we collect cell phones? We accept them all year long. Mm -hmm. um, we have been participating in the Gorillas on the Line cell phone campaign. Um, that was going to end in April, but now we, they're extending it to World Gorilla Day, which is September 24th. Um, that celebrates the day the Diane Fossey founded the Karasofi Research, Research Center. Excellent, that's awesome. And if guests want to contribute their old electronics, their old cell phones, where can they do that? The easiest way is to take them directly to the guest relations consult office, and um, as soon as the zoo opens, they would be happy to accept them for you. Good call, good call. Of course, we know we need to stay in our spots and hunker down, just like her shirt says over there. Ooh, that was a good one. Now, thank you guys so much for spending time with us, for learning about gorillas. Is there anything real quick you want to tell us about the animals we have here? Sure. Well, this is our backshore group of gorillas, so it's made of three teenage boys. This guy right here is George. He's our oldest. He's 16 years old. Um, now these guys are western lowland gorillas, so unfortunately they're not increasing like the mountain gorillas that Candace talked about are. Um, and the way that recycling cell phones helps them is it reduces the need to mine for a substance called coltan that is used in cell phones. Um, so when we recycle that and keep the phones in circulation, we reduce the need to tear down their habitat. Wow, that's great. I love that there is something that we can do to help these gorillas all the way in Africa from right here in Oklahoma. That's really, really important to me. All right, now. Thank you guys so much again for spending time with us here on this Earth Day. We want to make sure that you guys are still hanging out with us because remember, we have those potential free gifts for the first 20 people to tell us why they love the Earth on our comment section. We'll send you guys a pollinator kit so you guys can have your very own garden at home. Now, if you guys are feeling so connected to our gorillas and the zoo animals we have here, you guys can donate to the zoo. If you go back to that Facebook page, right at the top where we pinned our uh, fundraiser, you guys can donate to help us offset some of our operational costs. We have a fundraising goal of just $1,500. But if you guys have been checking out our shirts during this uh, video that we have, we actually have all three of them here. These are the Love Your Zoo shirts. We've got Comfort Down. Wash your, hands. Wash your hands and keep your distance. You can find the link to buy those shirts right there in the caption, and they are limited edition, so make sure that you get them, okay? Now, we will be doing our next video coming up at 1 o'clock, so make sure that you guys stick around and leave those comments for us. We really want to hear about why you love the earth, maybe something that you want to do to help the earth today, and we are just having so much fun with you guys. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, welcome back to our virtual Earth Day celebration, our party for the planet. 
My name is Erica Buckwalter and I am the Family and Interpretive Programs Manager here at the Oklahoma City Zoo. Now, I hope you guys have been having a gila of a good time <laughs> learning about gorillas uh, so far. And so today we're going to kind of switch gears and we're going to move on over to a conservation project that we're doing in Guatemala or we're supporting, I should say, in Guatemala. With me, I've got Rebecca Schneider. She is the Director of Conservation and Science. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, happy Earth Day. Oh, happy Earth Day. <laughs> Can you tell me about the uh, project that we are supporting in Guatemala? I would be happy to. We are very proud to be supporting the uh, Foundation for the Conservation of Endangered Species of Guatemala. And in short, that is known as Fundesqua. Oh, well, that's shorter. A little bit harder, though. <laughs> So that organization is special because it focuses on endangered species in Guatemala that really don't receive conservation attention from any other groups. Excellent. So um, how does this, this community group work? How do, what are their, the foundation of their practices there? Because it's a little bit different than other conservation organizations out there. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the endemic reptiles of Guatemala are some of the most endangered and unprotected animals on the planet. And so this group is fo focusing specifically on two species, the critically endangered Guatemalan beaded lizard, and we have Gila monsters that are being shown here today. We do have Guatemalan beaded lizards here at the zoo, but they're not currently on exhibit. So we're showing the Gila monsters, which are related species that are found here in the US. And the other species that Fundesco focuses on is the Campbell's alligator lizard which is a small tree dwelling lizard. And uh, those lizards are both critically endangered for two main reasons. So one is because they are naturally uh, live in very small areas of the country. So their range is really restricted and they're persecuted because of misconceptions that they're dangerous to people. So Fundesqua addresses those two threats specifically. So for the habitat destruction threat, so those animals, because they are found in small areas, they're particularly vulnerable to any kind of habitat destruction. And they're also found in places um, like the rest of the planet where the human population is increasing and those folks need resources that the lizards themselves need. So Fundesco helps the communities um, in, those um, in those areas by um, providing them with saplings of fast growing trees, which they plant then in community forests. So these people live in remote areas, they can have access to electricity, and they have to use firewood to cook all of their meals and heat their homes, and they rely on the forests for that. The lizards also rely on those forests, so as people gradually cut those forests down for firewood, they need to be replaced to restore the lizard's habitat, but then also to provide the resources that the community needs. So, uh, there are several communities that are part of this project. 20, um, I know 10 community forests have been planted so far. Each of those are 25 to 30 acres in size and they're planted with fast growing trees that can be harvested within just a few years. The communities actually take care of the saplings, they water the trees, they help to plant them. And then they also help plant uh, slow growing trees that are important for the old growth forest that the lizards rely on. And so far, over 200,000 trees have been planted. And this organization was only established in 2013, so that's really impressive. And people are able to start harvesting from those forests now. The other way that Fundesco uh, helps to uh, protect the lizards is they address the persecution problem. So again, these lizards are believed to be dangerous to people, but they're not. The alligator lizard doesn't have a venomous bite at all. The Guatemalan beaded lizard does have a venomous bite, but it would, it's not harmful to people. Like they would normally never be aggressive towards people. So the only time you get bitten is if you harassed one or picked one up. So they uh, do community outreach. They actually take alligator lizards out into these communities, show them to the people, show that they're not dangerous. They do a lot of conservation education programs in the local schools, teach the children and the community why the forests are important, why they're important for the community and also for the lizards and how they benefit both. And that the lizards um, are important, but they're native species that should be protected. Wow, that's really excellent. As an educator, I really understand why it's really important to start out with the students. Oftentimes when you have older generations, they have these deep ingrained thoughts and 
ideas and it's very hard to kind of break those down to kind of give them more factual information because it's kind of hard to combat that culture. So what you do is you start with the really young students, you teach them that this lizard is not dangerous to you, look I'm holding it, you know, maybe you give them a coloring book that explains how they can be a superhero for that specific species. There's a lot of things that you can do to inspire those students to become stewards for the environment. Because we really are depending on our youth to help save our planet and to kind of turn around some of those negative impacts that humans have had on the environment. I really, really enjoy what they're doing in their community because it does create that buy-in. You can't have a conservation uh, project without involving that community. If you come into somebody's um, their home, their life, and say, hey, stop doing this thing. I know you need it, but the animals need it too. You don't create that buy-in, but if you can go in and say, hey, I'm gonna help you. I know that you need this firewood. I'm gonna show you how to create it quickly so you can still have your resource, but we're also gonna save these animals in conjunction, and I just think that's really great. Now, you did an awesome job explaining all about that project. <laughs> Where does the zoo fit in? How do we get into this? So this project is special because the zoo is actually leading it. So our curator of herpetology and aquatics, Dr. Brad Locke, who unfortunately couldn't be here today to talk about the project himself, but he started this project in Guatemala. He helped uh, found Fundesqua, and he actually directs the program in Guatemala. So this is a project that the zoo's leading. And uh, we also provide significant financial support to this uh, organization annually. So. Fundesco is one of the zoo's conservation legacy partners, and what that means is that we support them for multiple years with significant financial support. So that's used for the forests that are being planted and also for the conservation education programs in the schools, which so far have reached 200,000 children. So it's a really big impact that this project's having. The zoo also last year provided some funding from our Roundup Emergency Fund and that was used to support one of the communities whose crops completely failed last year because of drought in the area. So the forests are important not just for the firewood and the habitat for the lizards, but they also stabilize the microclimate in that area. These people are reliant on growing most of their own food, and they rely on the forest to stabilize the climate there and also to prevent erosion. As the habitat's been degraded and as climate change is happening, then there are problems like drought. And so this community lost all of their crops in one particular growing season, and they were suffering, gonna have a real serious food shortage, shortage because of that. There's no government program in Guatemala to assist them. And so the zoo and Fundesco stepped in with some emergency funding, and we provided 30 tons of food for that community of uh, 2,500 people to help them get through until they would plant their next um, crops. That's really remarkable. And I think the most important thing that you brought up there is that it does it did come from Rhonda for Conservation. And our community members, you guys, are the ones that help us fund that. When you guys round up to the next dollar, you guys are directly impacting conservation. So if you guys have already done it, you're doing it. You're helping us out and you're helping us save species. And I just appreciate that so much. So thank you. Rebecca, is there anything else that you want to add about this awesome organization? Well, I would love to say how people can help. So um, as you just said, the Roundup for Conservation Fund, that's something that everyone contributes to when they come here to the zoo, if they choose to round up when they make purchases. That is a significant source of funding for our conservation programs that the zoo is part of. The other big source of funding for conservation is comes from the Oklahoma Zoological Society. And most of that money is generated actually through our zoo membership sales. So if people would buy or renew their Zoo Friends membership, that is the money that we use to support our conservation legacy partners like Fundesqua. Awesome. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for spending time with us. I appreciate having you here and telling us about Fundesqua. That's, it's just a really great project. Now, if you guys are feeling froggy, I'm in my herpetarium over here, you guys are feeling froggy you guys can donate to the zoo go back to that zoo's facebook page pinned at the top of the page is a donation button so you guys can go ahead and donate and help us offset some of the operational costs but if you guys have been checking out my shirt and rebecca's you guys can go to the link in the caption and get these limited edition shirts they're really great they also go to support the zoo they're super cute and they've got these really great pandemic uh quotes here so keep your distance 
wash your hands. And we also have one featuring prairie dogs that says hunger down. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you guys continue to hang out with us. We do have a couple more videos, but once this video is done, do not forget to comment with why you love the earth. And the first 20 people to comment are gonna get a free Party for the Planet pollinator kit. So you guys can have your own pollinator garden right there at home. So make sure you comment, let us know what you're thinking, how much you love the earth, and thanks for hanging out with us. I'll see you guys later. Bye. 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 everybody welcome back to our virtual celebration of the 50th anniversary of earth day here at our party for the planet celebration now have you guys heard probably not because a group of giraffes is actually a tower or a journey so no herds here now my name is erica and i am the family and interpretive programs manager here and i'm actually hanging out with some of our animal caretakers we are dedicated it is sprinkling on us, but we wanted to bring you some interesting stuff. So here I've got Elizabeth, who is our senior animal caretaker. And I've got Tracy over here, who is the curator of Hoofstock. Yeah, that's the one. Perfect. Now, thank you guys so much for being here with us. We're excited to be here, even with that. Tracy, before we start talking about conservation, can you tell us a little bit about our tower or journey that we have here? Absolutely. So standing right here with us, braving the sprinkling rain, is Ellie. She is our oldest giraffe at 19 years old. You zoom way back in the back. That is her daughter, Julu. Julu was born here and she is four years old. I'm going to throw in a little fun fact here. Julu just recently uh, became taller than her mom as well. Oh. And then who did not come out today is Dimitri. He is staying in the barn with the rain and he is three years old. And that will have our breeding group of giraffes as well. So we have three here. Awesome. Now real quick, I kind of want to go over, will you stop Ellie? I kind of want to point out that tongue there. Elizabeth, can you tell me about her tongue as she walks away? <laughs> so giraffes do have a long tongue. They're about 18 inches and they're prehensile. So you'll see she wraps that around and grabs the browse or the lettuce. And the wild bill are going to eat trees. And so what they do is they wrap that long tongue around a branch and strip off all those leaves. And so that tongue is pretty strong actually. Now, uh, I see the way that she's sticking her tongue out right there. If you guys could see my tongue, it's very pink. That's not the case for Ellie's tongue here. It is not. Uh, it is believed that because they spend so much time eating that it is dark and that helps protect them from the sun. Very good. Look at that tongue. <laughs> how, how neat is that? Yeah. You guys have actually had a really unique opportunity through the zoo. You guys actually traveled to Namibia in January. Can you tell our guests a little bit about that? Absolutely. So we traveled to Namibia to assist the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. And really what is unique about the Giraffe Conservation Foundation is that they are the only organization that focuses solely on the conservation and management of giraffes throughout um, Africa. So right now they work at about 15 different countries in Africa. And why is this so important? Well, their work that they do is so critical because over the last about 30 years, the population of giraffes has actually decreased about 40%. Most people think that the giraffe, the very iconic giraffe on the savanna with lots of numbers, we're actually finding that they've decreased a lot. And why this is important is because when we did the assessment, we now have our giraffes are either near threatened to actually critically endangered. And the reticulated giraffes that we have here at the zoo are actually considered to be endangered. 
And part of the reason why they are endangered is really due to human activities. So when we talk about habitat loss, where there's deforestation or mining, as well as some poaching, um, it's really affecting the giraffes and their population as well. So the work that the GCF is doing is very critical. That's pretty cool. Now, one quick question that I have about giraffes, is there just like one umbrella giraffe? Are there lots of different little subspecies? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. So until recently, there was considered to be only one species of giraffe. And through new research, new DNA analysis, we actually are finding that there may be four species and subspecies. And so the great thing about that is when we did uh, assess populations, we got to assess those populations, and now we can really target conservation efforts to where they're needed the most. Wow, that's really great. Now, uh, Elizabeth, can you tell me a little bit about um, GCF? I see your hat there. Awesome. Can you tell me a little bit about the efforts of what they do in the wild? Yeah, so GCF is actually is part of a wide range of efforts to help save giraffes. One is Twiga Tracker, which is the largest GPS satellite tracking system to monitor giraffe population. They also um, take DNA samples for the taxonomic research, and they organize um, stakeholder workshops to help people bring people together and write conservation plans for uh, different countries. And they also have this really cool program that we got to see called Giraffe Spotter. It is a photo identification program that helps researchers identify giraffes so that we can better understand their population. That's awesome. So can you guys talk a little bit about some of the field research you did while you were in Namibia? And like, what did you love about the experience? <laughs> um, so as we kind of talked about, the DNA was really fun. We actually got to watch um, some of the DNA sampling out there and to see that um, that uh, system and that effort and really what it's been able to do for the giraffes was really cool for me to see. And then the other really exciting thing for me as a giraffe keeper was to see their behavior. So here we work really hard as keepers to make sure that their natural behaviors are being exhibited. So when I got to see that behavior in the wild and I know I'm seeing it here at home, it makes me feel really good. And it was just, you know, it's amazing to see these animals in the wild. Um, and that was a real treat. That's awesome. How inspiring. What about you, Tracy? What did you take away from that process? What was your favorite part of it? Absolutely. Well, one of our main uh, research activities that we did was to search for giraffes. And you think that would be really easy to spot them, but they camouflage really well in their environment. So once we spotted the giraffes, we actually took data on them. So we collected photographs, we saw who they were with, um, their age, uh, if they had a calf, if there was breeding. So we got to see a lot of the behavior and we got to collect a lot of that data, which really goes to long-term monitoring. And it doesn't only uh, affect the giraffe population that we were studying, but again, it will affect the conservation efforts across Africa, which is really exciting for me. The biggest thing and the one thing that I really, really loved, uh, seeing giraffes in the wild absolutely was a thrill. Seeing all the other animals as well. But really about conservation, it's about people. And so we got to really see the people that were around that live and share their land with the giraffe. And we got to see how excited they were to be involved and be part of giraffe conservation as well. So I think that was one of my most exciting was really just to see all the aspects of conservation and see how excited people were as well. That's awesome. If you saw us earlier, we talked a little bit, a little bit about Fundesqua and how it is a community um, conservation organization and how they really want to make sure their community is involved, that they have the buy-in and things like that. So I'm so glad to hear that GCF also has that community tie-in because that's what makes conservation work, is involving that community, making sure they care about the animals in the way that you do and that they're also getting something from it. If they're not getting anything, then they can't get behind that kind of conservation. So, man, we've got some really cool things that are going on here. Now, um, how is the zoo supporting conservation, specifically for giraffes? Um, two ways, and especially for GCF. So every day, or every day, every year, we have a World Giraffe Day, so that's on June 21st, and our caretakers organize a fundraiser that uh, benefits GCF. And last year, that benefit was for Twiga Tracker. 
So it was exciting to see that what we uh, fundraised and donated to GCF was actually being used out in the field. So it was a great connection for us, as well as the zoo is actually a partner with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums SAFE, which is saving animals from extinction. And GCF is also one of the conservation partners in that program as well. So those are a couple ways that we partner. Now, if the guests who are watching want to get involved with um, giraffe conservation, Elizabeth, what are the, some of the things that they can actually do to kind of take part in that, be a part of conservation? So one thing that everybody can do is sign the Global Deal for Nature petition. It's calling on world leaders to protect half of our land and seas. Um, as we talked about, loss of habitat is huge for these guys. That petition can be found at globaldealfornature.org and your support is really appreciated in that. Well, that's really awesome. I hope that we are back in session by World Giraffe Day because I know that you guys are definitely missing being able to feed our giraffes, get up close and really make those connections with our animals. Now, thank you so much for hanging out with us for our next, our last session of, no, sorry, not last, one more. Don't go anywhere, please, I'll get in trouble. <laughs> now, thanks for hanging out with us for our uh, fourth Party for the Planet video today. Now, if you are feeling so inclined and you would like to donate to the zoo, go back to that Facebook page, go to the top where there is a post pinned there. You guys can donate directly to the zoo. That would help us offset some of the costs during this really challenging time, and we'd really appreciate that. But as you can see, we all have a very favorite shirt here. We've got our Keep Your Distance Love Your Zoo t-shirt. So if you would like to purchase one of those for your very own, you follow that link in the caption. And it's really going to help out our zoo. We are missing you guys, and you know that we're mi or you're missing us. So um, thanks for hanging out with us. And uh, let's get another close-up view of Ellie here. Look at her eating her greens. Breeding. 
Uh, but with the handful that are, that are in the U.S., we hope to establish an assurance colony with these guys. Wow, that's wonderful. That's really neat. Now, I know that turtles and tortoises are some of the most endangered vertebrates in the world. Um, can you tell our fans what's being done to kind of help save those populations? Sure. Well, I think, again, a lot of people don't realize that they are the most endangered group of, uh, of vertebrates or you know, animals with backbones. Mm -hmm. And that's because a lot of things, you know, what you think about a, a turtle or a tortoise, that you know, they're slow, they take a long time to grow up, uh, they don't tend to reproduce. She's going to go again, so I'm going to put her down. <laughs> um, they don't tend to reproduce very rapidly, so kind of the opposite thing that, that rats and roaches and things like that that are hard to get rid of do. And so when they are under pressure, they're collected or they lose their habitat, it's really hard for them to rebound. Luckily, there are dedicated folks um, around the world working to save turtles and tortoises. The Turtle Survival Alliance, um, which we're a partner with, uh, is, is uh, a group working in a number of countries across the globe uh, to save critically endangered turtles and tortoises. Wow, that's interesting. So, um, is this something that's only happening abroad, or turtles only disappearing in other countries? No, I mean, this is, uh, you know, obviously an exotic case with the plowshare tortoise, but uh, turtles and tortoises right here at home are, are under threats. And I don't think a lot of people realize this, but the U.S. actually exports in excess of 10 million live turtles and tortoises every year. These are going to pet markets in Europe and in Asia and other places. They're also being used to stock farms for farming operations, for food, because a lot of people eat them. Uh, and so there's a massive international trade in these wild animals. And again, because they are so susceptible to being over harvested, that's why so many are in danger. Oh, that's really interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more about what TSA does in Myanmar and Madagascar? Sure. Well, we've got uh, projects all over the globe. A couple of the key ones are in, uh, in Myanmar, mm -hmm. uh, where we're working to save uh, a couple of species that uh, have actually been extirpated from the wild. They were extinct in the wild for a number of years. Um, we focused on breeding programs in country there to uh, breed up those animals and then put them back into the wild with release programs. Uh, same thing in Madagascar, where not just the plowshare tortoise, but radiated tortoises that, that live there, heavily exploited for the pet trade. Um, there are massive seizures of these animals. Uh, around the globe, and we're working to pull those back in, uh, establish them in rescue centers in Madagascar to be able to release them back to the wild. Has the zoo ever done anything in Madagascar? I know a couple years back there was a huge seizure. Can you maybe say what we've done? Sure. Well, we've done a number of things in Madagascar. Again, we had you know, the one seizure in particular that was uh, about 18,000 animals that were confiscated. Uh, we sent a number of staff over there to help care for them um, and to help uh, work on the release plans. Uh, so we've been actively involved in that. Uh, the zoo also su has supported uh, some other programs. We support a, a biology grad student at the University of Oklahoma who's working on uh, river turtles in Central America and Belize, another critically endangered species that's there. So we're supporting our, our partners and working in, in a number of countries like that. Wow, that's really neat. Thank you so much for telling me that. So um, how are we directly supporting TSA? I know we're, we're helping out with staff, you know, we are helping with college students. What else are we doing for them? Well, they're one of our key legacy conservation partners. So uh, our friends at uh, the Oklahoma Zoological Society, uh, as well as some of the, the money that we get contributions here on grounds, go to support, financially support the efforts of the TSA. Uh, I've personally been involved with them. Turtles are a pet passion of mine, so I've been involved on the board uh, with TSA for, uh, for quite some time. That's awesome. I mean, these animals really, really need our help, and it's globally as well as locally. So if you had the advice for maybe our guests or viewers that are watching, how could you suggest that they might be able to help out with species like this? Sure. Well, the easy, easiest thing is to buy a zoo membership, and as soon as we're back open, and we hope that soon, we'd love to welcome you back out here. Come to the zoo, come off and learn about turtles. Um, the different types and, and the various issues that are around them. Uh, and get out here and you know, contribute where you can, obviously. Um, but the other thing you can do with turtles and tortoises being an issue here at home, turtles in particular, um, now is the time of year when you know, they're coming out of hibernation and they're starting to move around. And so a lot of turtles are out there crossing roads. Um, the males are out looking for females, and then pretty soon the females will be out looking for places to lay eggs. And road mortality is a huge issue with these guys. Um, just like picking them up for the pet trade, if you hit one on the road, it's a 
and water. Right. Um, they've evolved to avoid most predators, but there's not much they can do against the car. So if you see one crossing the road and you can safely stop, emphasize that, uh, stop moving across the road in the direction that it's going so they can get where it needs to go. They do have a home range, they know where they are and where they're going, so don't pick it up and take it to where you think might be better, just put it where, where it's going, provided it's safe for you and safe, safe for you from the turtle. I'm really glad that you brought that up, because a lot of people see a turtle and they're like, I'm going to save it, I'm going to take it home and give it a, a good life. Is that something that's a wise idea? Not particularly. You know, they're, these things live a long time. They don't get hit by cars or picked up or lost in the pet trade. Um, so having a pet turtle is a long-term commitment, so it's not, not to be taken lightly. And again, you don't want to just pick it up in one place and dump it back somewhere else because they're not going to do well. So the best thing to do is leave them be, enjoy them where they are. If they're in a dangerous spot, you know, try to get them to a little bit safer locality in the direction that they're headed. Yeah, and, and I hope you don't mind me asking. I know the zoo's been closed for quite a while, but uh, we do have some construction projects coming mm -hmm. up. Can you tell me a little bit about Turtle Plaza out there? Sure. Well, one of the things, we needed to give a facelift to the area that's outside of the Herpetarium uh, for some time. And so right now, while the zoo's closed, it's all top secret, um, we're renovating that space into a series of ponds and walkthrough areas that will feature a lot of native amphibians and native turtles and things like that. And so we're anxious that hopefully about the time that we, uh, we, we reopen, that'll be uh, opening as well, and you'll be able to come and and, uh, and enjoy that new exhibit. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that little tidbit. I know that people are definitely missing the zoo and that's one little thing we can share with them because I know they've seen those construction fences from before when we, uh, before we happened to close. So uh, thank you so much for helping us hang out here for Party for the Planet and celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. This is a perfect way to close out our series. I really hope that you guys enjoyed that virtual series that we were giving you, you learned about gorillas and giraffes and turtles and reptiles in Guatemala and native songbirds. Make sure you guys check out the zoo's website and follow our posts for more ways that you guys can help the animals. And if you're feeling up to it, we would really love your help. If you guys could donate to the zoo to help offset some of those operational costs, you guys can go back to the Facebook page, find that pinned post and you guys can donate directly. Or, like I said, all day long, if you're digging this awesome shirt that I have, the Love Your Zoo Limited Edition, you guys can follow that caption, uh, follow that link, and then you guys can go purchase them yourself. These guys are selling super quick, and trust me, you want to get in on this. So, I'm going to sign off here. Once again, my name is Erica. Keep your distance, hunker down, and wash your hands. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Bye.